Welcome back, everyone. I want to remind you that live captioning is available for this session and that the session will be recorded for future viewing. For questions during this session, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We won't have time to answer all questions, but we will get to as many as we're able to in the time allotted for the session. Also, in addition, uh, in the interest of time, we've decided to forego full introductions of our panelists, so please visit our website or your program for full bios. This session is called Ask the Auction House, and I'm pleased to welcome our moderator, Julia Courtney. Julie has nearly 25 years experience in the museum field and is currently the collections curator for the Art Complex Museum in Duxbury, Massachusetts. She is the editor of When Is It Okay to Sell the Monet? Julia. Welcome everybody to Ask the Auction House. It's gonna be an exciting session. We're so happy you could join us today. Somewhere between the decision to deaccession an object and the decision to spend the proceeds received for the object is the sale of the object. So we'll be speaking a lot about that today. Many, if not most of those sales are conducted by public auction. We've assembled a panel of the most knowledgeable experts from auction houses to answer questions about the services they provide, the effect of the pandemic on markets and prices, the impact of the American Association of Museum Directors statement on sanctions for museums, the effect controversial deaccessioning might have on price, and other practical questions that you may have about the auction process. If you have questions, as um, the Dean said, please use the Q&A function of Zoom. I'm gonna shout out to our graduate TA, who's gonna be helping with the session, Ethan Clearfield. He um, is a museum studies candidate here at Syracuse University. So brief introductions of our panelists. Um, they include Nina Del Rio, the vice chairman of Sotheby's. Nina has led museum, private and corporate art services to, since 2004. Under her direction, Sotheby's has overseen the vast major majority of institutional and corporate collections to have come to market over the past decade. Next, we have Michael Shapiro, Senior Advisor, Hinman Auctions. He's the former director of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the High Museum of Art in Atlanta, and currently serves as Senior Advisor for Museums and Private Collections at Hinman Auctions. And then Allison Whiting, Senior Museum Advisor for Christie's. She's presently an exclusive consultant to Christie's and was head of the Christie's Museum Services Department for over 26 years. So welcome panelists. Thank you so much for joining us today. Each of these panelists holds the most senior position in their firms with responsibility for museum services. Their complete guide bios can be found on the symposium website. So we're gonna divide this session up a little bit because we have some questions that we feel will be common among most of the participants. So we'll start with those and then we will go to the Q&A toward the end. So first we'll talk about museum and auction house services that um, services auction houses provide for museums. Then we'll talk about the current market and how the pandemic has affected museums, the art, uh, art market and deaccessioning. And then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about how the AAMD statement has and will affect uh, potentially future sales at auction houses. And then we'll shift to the Q&A. So hopefully we'll get it all in. Um, and we'll start, I'm gonna uh, first pose a question. I will always cue the, the panelists. I'm gonna start with Nina Del Rio with this question. Given that our audience members from museums may not have used a, an auction house yet, can you describe the services that you provide specifically for museums? Yes, thank you. And first of all, I want to say thank you so much for having me today. I've been following the entire symposium with great interest, and I think it's really important to be talking about all of the issues that you all are surfacing. Um, so how do we work with museums? First, I will say we work with museums globally. Um, and at Sotheby's, it's really, this is a very committed practice for us. We 
we actually hire a number of ex-museum staff on our staff. And I think the way we work with museums really defines us as an organization. So we work with institutions, small, large, urban, regional, across every single collecting category. And we also support museums um, through benefit auctions and we support um, museums financially. We also have a museum partner program with 450 museum partners globally called the Sotheby's Preferred Program. So just to give you a huge sort of breadth and so many different directions that we work with museums. Um, we have a museum services department because the needs and sort of decision-making of museums is very different than that of an individual. Museum decisions are made in committee. They need to be documented. They're often public um, and they need to be extremely thorough and thoughtful and our job is to really help museums um, make fully informed decisions, especially at moments of great transition. So of course that always includes collection refinement, helping museums make acquisitions, helping museums identify loans and helping museums sell. We're there to partner with museums either to augment the curatorial staff by bringing expertise where you might not have curatorial representation. We do research. We become your PR partner if that's helpful. So I think, again, we're doing our jobs well when we can be knowledge providers, when we can help the museum and really partner with them, help them to make the most informed decision that they can. Thank you, Nina. And Allison, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, thank you for, for, for having me also. Um, and I think Nina sums it up well, I mean, we're international as well. So all the stuff she said more or less applies on this end. The one thing I always tell museums when I visit them, particularly to the point of many have never worked with an auction house before is that you don't need to be buying or selling art to um, uh, work with an auction house or a, a range. It's called museum services for a reason. There are a range of services that we offer to nonprofit organizations. You don't even have to have a collection um, to avail yourself of services that might be meaningful to your institution. So um, I would add to the obvious, which is of course, we're always working with museums on buying and selling, but I would say that more equally, uh, we are committed to doing things like appraisals um, uh, for a variety of reasons. I mean, usually for outgoing loans, um, but often for more and more often for indemnities. Um, we also, one of the things I think that we love to do is to connect museum curators with our specialists um, in an effort to help source artworks for loans. Um, obviously our specialists know what collectors are collecting and we can often find things for exhibitions um, and that kind of a service is great. Um, we spend a lot of time fulfilling rights and reproductions requests um, and uh, fulfilling an enormous amount of educational um, initiatives. So in a non-COVID year, a lot of those initiatives and programs are at museums. Um, needless to say, this past year they have not been, but we've done a huge amount online uh, with museum collecting groups and membership groups and trustees. Uh, and I think Nina, you might have mentioned um, benefit auctioneers. I think when the galas get going again, if there's a auction fundraising component to that, we have a host of uh, colleagues that are trained specifically to do just benefit auctions. Um, so uh, the only other thing I guess I would add is again, when everybody's traveling again, um, so many museums take groups to the art fairs, for example, um, we have, uh, to Nina's point about being global, we have representatives in probably any country that you're going to go to. Um, and very often we're happy to open doors to private collections if you would like to tour those. So um, we always encourage uh, institutions to call us if there's anything we can do for them on sort of any of those fronts. And if we're lucky, we get to work with them on an auction, either buying or selling something too. Thank you, Allison. And um, that's really important to point out the appraisal factor because we museum people are dependent on you for all of that. Uh, Michael, anything you'd like to add? And also, can you talk to, uh, to speak to well, the um, question about how would a museum necessarily pick out an auction house uh, to work with? Sure. Uh, well, of course, Nina and Allison have really summarized it beautifully, but uh, I think it's like um, 
bringing on any uh, consultant, uh, that there needs to be a sense of trust and comfort and a kind of um, chemistry uh, because all three of the firms in this panel uh, 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 handle works of art from, from antiquities to, to contemporary. Uh, and uh, all three have a very good track record. But I, I, I think the point that my colleagues made about how the auction specialists can um, broaden or deepen uh, dialogue with the curators in a museum, it's a real wonderful extension. And I, and I would just encourage the museum people who are, who are watching this to, uh, to not feel self-conscious about reaching out to museum services uh, and just having a, an introductory conversation about what might be possible. Definitely agree. Great resources. And um, the next question that we'll sort of wrap up this segment with is, um, can you explain the difference between a private and a public auction for sales and um, what the benefits um, are both? Nina, I'm going to go back to you to begin. Um, we always approach any sale process with how are we going to create success for the institution? And, and really, what does success mean? Success means, of course, optimizing the financial opportunities. Success also means communicating correctly with the museum's objectives in mind. And, and again, museums are, are, are public. They are, they're in the public domain and the public pays great attention to what they're doing. And so sometimes um, sale at, at public auction makes sense. It, it can be the most transparent form of sale. And, and in some instances, it really auction is the only way to demonstrate that, that you're really maximizing the financial opportunity. In other instances, and they really do exist, and I'm happy to bring up examples, private sale can be better. Um, private sale, I think, is, is veiled under this, you know, there's this mystique that, that someone's trying to hide something, but in fact, private sale, because an object is just some, simply more particular, it needs more explanation, there are specific buyers for that object, private sale could yield a higher price, and private sale can also be communicated differently. It's not, um, a work isn't put out for the entire world to see, but that doesn't mean that the museum isn't actually being transparent about selling that object. Often museums announce either, you know, at the time that a sale is confirmed or just after that, in fact, they've sold the object privately. So we really work, look at each um, example individually and we spend a lot of time both strategizing with the museum, but understanding, listening to the institution understanding how to create success specifically in this situation for them. Thank you so much. That's a great explanation. Allison, uh, any thoughts on that topic and anything different that you'd like to add? Um, I think I would say, I think there's, I think a understandable propensity for museums to want to sell at auction because of the transparency. Um, and there are occasions, as Nina explained, where we might suggest that a private sale may be a better option for them for a variety of reasons. Um, I think it's just super important for museums to understand that um, the auction house represents the seller in every instance. So we want what's best for you. We want what's most lucrative for you. Um, and uh, what's best for you in those arenas are, is best for us also. So. Um, I think you should feel confident if we're um, recommending a particular strategy that there's a good reason for that and your interests particularly are, are what we have in mind when we are making those recommendations. And sometimes that's based on finances, sometimes that's based on messaging, um, sometimes that's based on the particularity of a particular work um, and our knowledge of the market and who that might appeal to. And, um, but it's interesting. I think that one of the one of the things that we've noticed, and I think this is a, a, a notable to the pandemic, is there is definitely more conversation going on now uh, mm -hmm. in that arena about should we sell privately or should we sell at auction. Um, I've certainly had more of those conversations uh, this year than than ever before, and um, uh, there is more property definitely being consigned in that with that intention. I can imagine. And it's great to know, you know, coming from a museum background that we can rely on all of your expertise in this sort of unknown area. Michael, how about you? Any thoughts? Yeah, uh, yeah I have a slightly uh, divergent 
perspective, based on my own <laughs> 30 years in uh, working in museums, uh, I, I have a distinct preference for, as Nina and Allison mentioned, the transparency of the auction itself. And, and although I've always been an enthusiast about color collection and refining the collection, uh, I've always gone to public auction. And I guess I would also say, but I mean, I take Nina and Allison's points. I think there are definitely circumstances that might merit and warrant going in that private way. But I guess I wonder too about what I would call the unforgiving uh, public eye at the moment. Uh, and if I were uh, uh, directing or curating a museum today, I would want to be especially careful and especially transparent. Uh, uh, that being said, Allison and Nina have a deep understanding of special circumstances that might merit another approach. I just would tend to go another way. Understandable. Thank you. Um, so we're going to shift to the thing on, on everyone's mind. Um, it's been a year since the pandemic took place or took hold. And almost that long since AMD made its statement waiving censure and sanctions for the use of proceeds in deaccessioning. So, um, Allison, you mentioned this a little bit. What changes have you seen since the, all this has come about? Um, what would you describe as sort of the before and after for museums and deaccessioning and auctions that you're seeing? Um, Nina, we'll go to you again to begin. I mean, I, I think, you know, as I, as I looked back anticipating this question, I actually, I actually took a look at whether sales had increased from museums. And in fact, while we've had so many conversations and we do all the, the time, I, I don't know that, that there are more museums selling now. I will say this, we are in touch with so many different institutions, talking to them every day about the experience that they're going through right now. And the world was turned on its head and that's no surprise to anybody. And museums have had to completely overhaul their operating budgets, their expectations. If you're in an urban center, your visitation is just dramatically reduced. If you are, were relying on those admissions um, as part of your revenue, like your, your, what you're looking at is completely different. Um, and, and, in, and in many cases, these are extremely dire um, really extremely dire sort of financial issues to, to grapple with. But it doesn't mean that every museum chooses sale as a way to navigate this. Some do, some don't. I think we're, again, having more conversations than we ever have. We're doing a lot of listening. We're doing a lot of understanding of the kind of individual circumstances of each institution. And if there's anything that I've been feeling throughout, in particular, the, these set of conversations during the Syracuse Symposium, is that yes, there are best practices. Of course, there are best practices for museums, um, but each museum is so individual in how they make their choices and how they set their strategies in, in the set of criteria it, you know, on which they make decisions. And it's our job to understand that. And then it's our job to help fill in knowledge. So I, you know, I know I, it may not be answering your question exactly. I will say there's so much more of that learning going on this year than there ever has been before as things are changing so rapidly. Yes, it's gonna be get more sales. We'll continue to, to see that. We will continue to work with museums to help them create success. And again, creating success is, it's financial, but it's also reputational. It's helping to make great informed decisions. It's, you know, there's a lot more that goes into those big transitional moments than just what's gonna get you the highest dollar. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you. And we'll go to Michael next. Um, are you seeing sort of an influx of conversation with museums? Yeah, exactly what Nina said, lots of conversations. And uh, a point I would just make is that th there is a difference between what I would call museum time and then, you know, the rest of the world time. Museum time is uh, beneficially slower than real world time. There are, I think, as Allison mentioned, the committee structure that uh, uh, that take time. So it's like, like turning a bit of a, a, not exactly an aircraft carrier, but uh, they're not as nimble as maybe some other uh, types of organizations. Um, uh, and I think that's, a, that's actually 
a good thing because undergirding the whole topic of deaccessions is is really the larger question of sustainability for American museums. That is the key question and it can't be answered overnight. So taking time to figure out an institutional plan, are we gonna try and build an endowment? Are we gonna, what's the relationship between fundraising? Uh, is it providing a disincentive for, uh, for donors? Uh, you know, what's the future of the collection and its directions? Uh, all of those uh, questions do take time to, to address internally. And so uh, I think to Nina's point, it's going to, uh, the conversations are going to accelerate because the, the issue, the core issue is not going away. It's uh, how can we sustain the normally undercapitalized American Museum? I just want to applaud that. Thank you, Michael. Completely agree. And Allison, let's go to you next. Um, I, I, they've said things so well. I mean, I would, I would 100% agree with Nina that um, every conversation I have with every institution is different. I have gotten beyond thinking I know what to expect because I don't. Um, some of the big institutions are doing just fine. Some of the smaller ones are doing great, um, and vice versa. And it is unique institution to institution. So there, there is that unpredictability about it, which is interesting. Um, the other thing that I think is just worth pointing out, I think because people would want to know, um, is I would say that um, in any sort of average year of selling, um, non-pandemic, obviously, uh, you know, the, the interest in selling artwork that would achieve many millions of dollars, say in excess of 10, we might have, I don't know, maybe three to five such conversations in a normal year. Um, you know, museums aren't typically looking at, at that sort of level of selling regularly. Um, I would say in this pandemic, there's definitely more activity uh, north of 10 million in the conversation uh, sphere, but not, not perhaps as much as you might think. I mean, I would say that at any given time over this past year, we've probably been engaged in eight to a dozen conversations at one time that represent $10 million plus business. So um, it's, it's notably increased, but it's not you know off the rails. That's helpful to know. Interesting. Julie, um, Julia, could I just throw in something? Um, uh, I, I advocate uh, also the, the traditional curatorial approach of pruning the collection from the bottom up, although there may be reasons for a Hail Mary to <laughs> sell something from the top down. I, I recognize that. But, but I do think the, uh, the blocking and tackling, so to speak, of, 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 of refining a collection uh, is is really an institutional mandate from my perspective, and uh, and the middle market, as opposed to the tippy top, uh, the middle market is is huge, uh, and can provide great benefits to the museums uh, if they're open to uh, let's say partnering with any of the three of us on a, let's say a longer term basis. Um, I don't wanna take our time, but I do wanna comment on both what Michael and Allison said. I think what Allison said is really important because you know, there's so much conversation and what we're not seeing is just a vast number of fire sales that, that aren't thoughtful. What we are seeing is a small number of strategic and, and generally you know, the result of decisions that have unfolded over many months, sometimes from before the start of COVID, and so none of the deaccessions that we've seen at any of the houses are, are, are works that wouldn't ordinarily be sold as Michael references in, in a sort of normal collection refinement. The timing might be different and the use of proceeds might be different, but what we're not seeing is, is museums making um, uninformed and, and decisions that aren't really responsible. I, I think we're, we're seeing the opposite. And so when Allison says, look, it, there might be a few more of these conversations. It's not a hundred. And it's not like every museum is 
is now making decisions to sell their collections. It might be ramped up, but it's, it's by no means um, dramatic. How's that? I, I, would, I would add to that also that, you know, the auction process, and Michael made the point earlier, it takes a long time in most instances for museums to decide to sell something and to put it through its paces and have the committee votes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, very seldom are museums moving uh, quickly. Um, so it, it needs to be noted, I think, that a great deal of what we sold this past year, I'm sure this is true for every auction house, a lot of what we sold last year was in process before the pandemic began. Um, you know, sales were delayed uh, in the spring. Uh, we particularly advised museums to be cautious about trying the online platforms before they'd really been tested. I mean, we've been having online auctions for a decade in many different categories, but, you know, is, is, is that the format to sell a million dollar work right now? And I think if the museums didn't need to proceed right away, we said, let's just take a pause. Um, so there was a lot of backup, backed up property um, that didn't really start showing up until the fall, I think. And again, a lot of that was decision-making made well before the pandemic. So I think what's, what's we all need to remember is that just because it's come to market in this pandemic year doesn't mean that it was suddenly brought to market because of the pandemic, I would say in most instances, that is not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, something that doesn't get uh, airtime in these kind of deaccession discussions is, is the way in which deaccessioned museum objects have been translated into major masterpieces for the benefit of that museum collection. And um, I just think in my own experience that there are some case studies that I could point to of selling something that had never been exhibited, had value, and it combined with some other funds turned into um, a super major acquisition that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. And those are institution building stories that um, that I think should, you know, if they were brought to light, I think it would be a source of uh, further encouragement and um, comfort. Let's shift for a minute. I have a couple of questions coming in about mechanics that I'm going to get to in just one minute, but let's shift to use of proceeds uh, from deaccessioning. What are you seeing, hearing uh, about how museums are using the proceeds at this point versus perhaps before the pandemic took hold? Um, what kinds of things are you seeing? What changes? Um, let's start with Allison this time. Um, well, you know, some are obviously using it for care of collections. And there was a big conversation this morning about what does that mean? Um, so that, that's a biggie. Uh, what I think you'll notice um, when museums sell at auction, um, we always encourage them to use what we call a property title uh, in the sale catalog, identifying their lots as belonging to a museum. And we do that because our buyers really love museum provenance in most instances. It means that material is fresh to the market and, and has not been on uh, uh, out in the market in many cases for decades. And, and so that is, is super appealing. Um, what you'll notice more and more and what we've seen this particular year is some museums like to say, not just property of the museum, but property of the museum sold to benefit the acquisition fund. Um, that has always been a favorite um, simply because it tells you exactly what they're doing with it. They're buying more, more art. Um, now you'll see more acquisitions and collections care uh, as part of a property title, I think. Um, and so there's obviously that, but I think in, in as much as there are um, unique circumstances at every museum, I find that, you know, museum directors are not uniquely, uh, or sorry, unanimously uh, advocates of use of sale proceeds for collections care. Um, many of them are still consider that blasphemous and are very um, committed to maintaining use of funds for acquisitions. So it's, you know, it's expanded, uh, but it's it's uh, still, I think where they can, they prefer and will continue to, to use them as much as possible for acquisitions. 
Michael, do you want to weigh in on that question? Well, you know, I, th I think Allison nailed it, really. Uh, just to <laughs> summarize what Allison already said, it's, yeah, uh, it, people are being thoughtful and careful. It, there's an expanded discussion. Uh, there's some, let's just call them traditionalists who may want to uh, stick to the collection uh, exclusively improving it. Uh, there are others that might be motivated to create an endowment or to support the operating budget in relationship to the, uh, and to an earlier comment may have also been Allison, where she talked about how localized all these museum situations are, or maybe it was Nina, but in any case, uh, that, that, that it's really apples and oranges. It's so, it's so localized and specific to the board sensibility, the history of the museum, the, the mission of it, the personalities, the heritage. Um, uh, but, but you do have a bifurcated system at the moment. So you have the, probably the majority sticking to the more traditional collection improvement and then an expanding um, minority uh, thinking of ways that they could further benefit the, the museum and support its collection. Thank you, Michael. And Nina, what have you seen out there? I mean, I, I, you know, I think Michael and Allison's take is exactly right. I, I will say this, there's no museum director who hasn't invested time understanding what it means um, to use proceeds for care of the collection to make their informed decisions with their board, whether or not to pursue that route. And it is a question on every single museum director's mind. So where while this may go you know they they as institutions are charged with interpreting this in the way that they feel is best and i i have to say i really truly respect that and and the question is being considered at every museum it doesn't mean that every museum is is making use of this or selling works from the collection but everyone is keeping themselves informed and making their good responsible decisions with their boards and i i really I, I believe strongly in, in institutions interpreting these guidelines for themselves. Um, and that's the important work that I think many of them are doing. I, I would add also to that, um, that, and then I'm sure Nina and Michael, you'll agree with this, that, that even museums that are not members of AAMD organizations are still incredibly aware of what the rules are for that particular group. Uh, and most of them sort of hold themselves up to that as well. Um, and they care what their peers think and they want to do it the right way. Um, so even if you're not a, a member, I think that that whatever's going on with the AAMD membership is affecting everybody. Sort of a mission to maintain best practices regardless yeah. of what's happening. Could, Excellent. Uh, uh, Julia, can I just add a quick thought? Um, I'm just thinking about metaphors for museum collections over the years. Uh, sometimes I, I remember John Walsh said, talked about museum collections as um, uh, sort of forests and that the forest uh, needed to be tended to and needed to be culled in order to be healthy. Uh, or, or in my own case, I think of museum collections as archeological layers added to by different generations of curators and directors and over time just like the growth of trees or something the uh, over time tastes market uh, judgments uh, and the institution itself evolves in different directions uh, so that so that uh, I guess I was talking to my daughter the other day and she said well dad you don't keep every pair of socks you've ever had right <laughs> totally totally. So I think there's a real uh, professional common sense aspect to deaccessioning that I think should be encouraged. And I, I say that to try and diminish what might be a fear, fear factor in some cases. Definitely. And let's speak real quickly about um, transparency and how museums are approaching this as they make decisions to deaccession um, and, you know, are you seeing anything different because of the um, pandemic and the AAMD statement? Are they less inclined or more inclined toward transparency? What are your, 
your thoughts on that. Nina, do you want to start? Um, yes, I think this is a very important topic because with, with less clarity, okay, so the change in the AMD guidelines, the, the, the limited change um, brings a little less clarity and more interpretation on the institution, as I, as I said. And so how the museums communicate what they're doing is ever more important. It's always socializing what you're doing as a public institution is always as critical and indeed has it has a real material impact, I believe, on your financial outcome. Successfully communicate what you're doing, let your constituents into the fold, help people to understand the good positive outcome that you're really going for, and your whole process will be more successful. This has become ever more um, important, scrutinized, picked at, um, under the microscope, in the press, you know, in a way that I've, I've never seen before, and I've been doing this a long time, so that it's really the first, um, the, the, or how about this, among the most important strategies to consider at the beginning of your process is how are you going to communicate this? How will you sort of allow all of your constituents from your members to your board, to your local community, to, to the sort of nation at large, um, how will you help people to understand why you're doing this, the fact that you're making great decisions, and that is, you know, it's game changing. Do it correctly and, and people will feel that they're part of the process. No, you don't have to make decisions with 100% consensus, but it will certainly help. And I, I think that's really heightened in the last year in a way that I've, I've never quite seen it. So it's a, an opportunity to educate as well as to conduct this type of transaction. I mean, I mean these institutions the, are always, sorry, please, Allison, go ahead. Sorry, I was just gonna add, Nina, that, that the point that I made a few minutes ago about the fact that much of what we've seen come to, to market this past year was in the pipeline already anyway, and it was not brought to market because of the pandemic, doesn't matter. The lens that everybody is looking at this through, particularly the media, unfortunately, is there's a problem. And so even if there isn't, we've had to line up the sort of Q&A talking points for all of our um, museum sellers, uh, because the assumption is there's a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And most of the time, there isn't a problem. Yeah. Well, so but they need to be prepared to address that. <clears throat> yeah, I think that, that goes to the earlier discussion point of how, how museum services can, uh, can assist museums. And part of what your, Nina and Allison are both saying is the communication strategy is something that, that the auction house can, uh, can advise on. And, uh, it, it's an important voice. I, I know, uh, I, an issue that I thought I just might throw in is just thinking about as museums consider deaccessioning uh, for collection care purposes, uh, I think there's a question for how museums will be able to recognize the donors to the original works of art that are being sold to benefit the collection. So normally, as, as we all know, uh, if I gave a painting and the museum sold the painting, uh, my, credit, my, my credit line would be carried forward to a new work of art that would be purchased uh, sometime in the future. Um, if, if the funds generated are going to another purpose, the care of the collections, there may need to be a new type of donor wall, uh, which are, is, you know, could easily be done, but needs to be done thoughtfully. Uh, so that so that uh, you don't inadvertently uh, disincent uh, donors. That's a really interesting idea. So um, I'm going to shift to some questions from the audience, and then before we wrap up, we'll talk a little bit about what's in store for the future. <laughs> now, um, mechanical question here: Can you explain what it means to have a reserve at an auction? and what a guarantee means and when it's appropriate for museums to use one or both of those things. Uh, let's start with Allison. Uh, so uh, the reserve uh, is a confidential uh, sum, which by law cannot be above the low estimate. Uh, it's agreed upon between the auction houses and the seller. Uh, and essentially what it is, is we agree that we will not part with this object on your behalf for less than the sum of money. 
Um, it needs to be on a, a bidding increment uh, and uh, it basically protects your interest. If there isn't enough interest in, in, in what it is you're trying to sell that day, the reserve isn't met because nobody's waving their paddle, then we will give you the property back. Um, so there's that. Um, guarantees, it's an interesting um, question about guarantees. Uh, again, uh, there's a lot more conversation about guarantees this year than ever before. Um, a guarantee basically is an insurance policy that you will make a guaranteed X number of dollars for the sale of your property. And it can be for one work, it could be for a whole collection. Um, uh, the way it works is the auction house essentially says you're uh, going to make $2 million on this sale no matter what. Um, so if, if, it's a, if it's a great day at auction and uh, the final bid price for whatever it is you're selling is $3 million, and we've guaranteed two, um, that million dollar upside, this is the price of the guarantee to, to the museum, is split um, in a not 50-50, but the auction house uh, or the third party backer gets a percentage of that upside between the two and the three million. Um, and But the, obviously the attractiveness, especially to museums that are trying to close a gap that need to know that they're going to have $2 million by a particular date, um, they get to go into the auction knowing that their interest is completely protected. The downside obviously is they may be leaving money on the table, partic particularly if, if something sells well. But those, those sorts of deals are, are very interesting to museums, especially now. Thank you, Michael or Nina, do you have any other comments on that? Uh, I just had one tiny point um, uh, to Allison's good explanation of reserves. Uh, sometimes if the reserve is not met and therefore, as Allison said, uh, the, the, the work of art uh, could be returned to the owner, but it also could, there could be a brokered post-sale uh, arrangement that occurs with um, one or more of the underbidders. So that negotiation could be handled uh, with, of course, the owner of the property making the, the final decision. It also, you know, when the museums go to the trouble of actually deaccessioning something, they usually don't want it back either. Um, occasionally we return property, but usually what happens is if it doesn't sell, as Michael says, in an after sale um, situation, we'll hold on to it for, you know, another sales cycle or a few sales cycles and we'll put it back in an auction, usually with a reduced estimate, um, and it ultimately will sell. Yeah, so exactly right. One of our audience members has asked what the term enhanced hammer means. Can one of you give us an explanation? Maybe Nina? Enhanced hammer means in some instances, we would share in what's called the buyer's premium with the seller. And in fact, we charge, and all of the auction houses charge a set buyer's premium. Each, each auction house does it a little bit differently, but meaning every buyer pays the same set of commissions, which are based on what um, the value of, of what something sells for. And in certain circumstances, we would um, offer to share a part of that buyer's premium with a seller. I, I would just say to, to add on to what Allison said and, and in, in speaking to the enhanced hammer, there are different financial strategies that speak to the objectives of sellers. And, and really what is our job? Our job is to be creative with these financial strategies so that we give our museums options to pursue. So while one museum might feel very strongly about going into a sale with an insurance policy, a guarantee, another museum might prefer to really, you know, take the risk and a guarantee mitigates risk, eliminates risk, where another strategy is I'm, I'm comfortable with a little bit of risk. I really want to maximize the dollars that I'm going to make. So, so mm -hmm. our job is to kind of whiteboard these options, whiteboard these decisions with the museums help them understand what their options are, be creative in coming up with options that speak specifically to that institution and, and help them make a decision. Because at the end of the day, you know, again, we want to be working with them in the long term and this is about creating success for them. Thank you. Another question that's come in is um, about the percentage that auction houses get um, for different sales. Um, is the percentage different 
for museums versus museums and nonprofits versus independent or private collectors? How does that work? Anybody burning to answer? I mean, I can address it if you'd Go like. <laughs> um, so again, the 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 amount that we charge buyers is is standard. So that's the buyer's premium, and what we charge sellers, you know, has sometimes. Um, it will look different based on the value of a collection, um, based on the you know number of objects, and, and based on who the, the seller is. But that is really you know each financial, as I said, each, each financial sort of um, structure is bespoke and individual to the seller um, and is unique. So they you know it, it varies across the board, institutions, individuals. But but I would also say uh, if I could just add on a teeny bit uh, that that the seller's commission is is uh, negotiable and I, I I would go out on a limb to say I would bet that Allison Nina and and myself are all particularly eager to advocate for the best interests of the museum and that that is the bottom line you know I mean all three auction houses are commercial ventures they're not tax uh shielded the way museums are but the museum services area within it it's almost and i think for the three of us it's almost an extension becomes an extension of that museum so getting the museums the best deal we can that's i think part of our job and i'm getting a nod from Nina and no, saying thank you. I was you, about Michael. to say museums <laughs> always get the best deal from Christie's. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> thank you. Okay, um, another question. There are many um, professional uh, museum professionals from small museums here today with us. What suggestions do you have for small institutions who are looking to deaccession material that's maybe lower in value in a flooded market. Michael, do you want to start? Or no, Allison, you look like you're ready. <laughs> I was going to say, well, we would just refer that to Michael. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, look, one thing that we always say to, to museums is sometimes they'll call and say, well, we don't think this is for Christie's. And I always say, let us decide that. And sometimes they're right. It's not for us. Um, other times it is. Um, we. The distinction between what Nina and I do is we're working in a global market, Michael, not so much. Um, but that doesn't mean that Michael doesn't have seven figure sales at, at, at his auction house from time to time, um, or that they don't want that property. They certainly do. Um, but there are different venues for different types of things. And I think that, you know, even no matter who they approach, any one of the three of us would give their best advice. There are times when there are portions of a collection that we could sell, but maybe the vast majority is not for us. Um, in, the, in cases like that, um, we will find another partner for them so that they don't have to say, great, you've taken the three best things. What do I do with the 15 things that you don't want? Um, we try to be full service, even if the sale isn't taking place here. Um, so sometimes there's just a straight up buyout um, where we'll go to another auction house or dealer and simply say, give us a bid for this. Um, and it's a competitive process, so they get the strongest offer. Um, and, but there are other times when we simply say, um, you know, this isn't for us, but I always like to be helpful. So if, even if it's a, this time it's not for Christie's, I usually give them at least two or three options for try these other uh, auction houses that may be interested. Um, so you'll always get your best advice, I think. I just want to add, and I, I think that's that's so well explained. Um, you know, a point that, that Michael made earlier, where collection refinement, uh, you know, it, it, as part of a sort of living, breathing, evolving collection, is an important exercise for any institution. And so, selling at the, you know, we we call it the low hanging fruit. Selling, you know, clean your closet. Um, um, selling at sort of the the outside of the collection is is can be a very productive exercise. And if the and I think where what all of the auction houses have learned is creating, and you know, Sotheby's, Sotheby's certainly takes this seriously, creating sale outlets that are different in different markets that that are maybe in the more moderately priced markets is very important for this reason in particular. A, a museum 
which, which is a, the steward of a very large collection, should be refining at these sort of outsides so that they can improve you know, what, what is really the sort of core of the collection. And so we've created a number of virtual online sale outlets to, to try to um, address that. And I think you know, more than ever, we, we all believe it's extremely important. And, and I suspect that we all handle a certain amount of material that, you know, maybe not exactly at the level we would prefer, uh, but we find a way, uh, the type of sale or type of circumstance uh, that we can handle it for the benefit of the museum client. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that, that we at Christie's do, I think particularly well is partner with institutions that are doing these gigantor looks at their collections where it's every collection is being looked at. To Nina's point, the low hanging fruit is, you know, easily decided. We're parting with that. Um, and needless to say, most museums have thousands of objects in their collections and reviews like that take several years in many instances. So we do have several um, instances where we have long-term partnerships with an institution um, where they know upfront what the terms of sale are gonna be. And we show up every time they say, here's a new list of things that we wanna review this month or this year, uh, and we review them with them. And the Christie's wor worthy, appropriate things come to Christie's and the things that are not, we help them dispose of in another way. But um, I think Nina's made a really good uh, effort throughout this presentation to really advocate for the fact that an auction house is a partner uh, to you uh, and that 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 what's best for you is is generally best for us also and our interest is your interest your interest is our interest it's a I, I think of it, it uh, you know I, I would imagine that both Michael and Nina as I do feel like our our museum partners are friends um, it is a very friendly um, warm relationship that we have with most of our clients. And, you know, maybe since we're focusing on the auction houses, we, we tend to forget that, that it takes uh, not only experience and a good eye and a good organizational skills for curators and directors, but it also takes courage to, uh, you know, step forward in some circumstances in a creative way and approach you know, just thinking back in my experience, could be a super major donor and say, you know, we've never exhibited this, but it could become a really great mm -hmm. something else. And uh, I, I just remember in hindsight, uh, doing that in St. Louis many years ago, a couple times. And uh, to my, in hindsight, I thought, wow, I had the chutzpah to go and talk to that guy and he said sure let's do it so um it, I, I think to to allison's point it becomes a real team effort between the professional staff and and the auction staff and um, it's kind of a great adventure i like that great adventure so here's a question too that i, I think is interesting um how do you proceed if a museum seller indicates that it's a priority for the object being uh, considered for sale remain in the public domain? Like, is that uh, a very different animal? I mean, it's, you know, want we, that. <laughs> yeah. Allison, please go ahead. I was just going to say, I mean, this is where the conversation about private sales comes in. Uh, obviously, the only way that you can control who the buyer is going to be is if you sell something privately. And so, that's one of those good reasons. Um, and if we are in agreement that this actually is going to be appealing uh, to another institution, um, we may well be able to uh, make that transaction happen. But you run the risk if you come to auction, there's no way we can control who's, who's buying. And you know, museums generally go into a, a sale um, with a fixed number. And I cannot tell you the number of times that museums are the direct underbidder because they can't go one more. Um, the way a private client can. So it's not that they don't buy at auction, but we can't control their buying at auction. I see. Okay, great. Um, and this question, um, you know, with all of the um, controversy that comes up in the news about 
um, certain objects being deaccessioned de and how the proceeds are used, et cetera. Is a painting that comes up on auction that is part of a controversy, is it sort of forever tainted? Does that affect the market price of a piece? Nina's yes. nodding. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 a concept that we've you know we've discussed with institutions time and again, and and again this this goes back to communication, um, communicating clearly so that your constituents understand what you're doing has actually a material positive impact on the final price paid, and so does the opposite. So, you know, confusion. I don't understand. This seems to be going down a road that doesn't feel productive. Um, takes the confidence out of the marketplace. And essentially buyers do not feel as confident bidding on a work of art that is sort of a lightning rod for public attention or controversy. And that has a hugely material impact on the final price paid, especially, I mean, I really think it's both in a private sale setting and in an auction setting, but especially at auction where adding another bidder or taking a bidder away has such a, a, a big impact on the final price paid. So this is something that took me a while to learn. And when I did, I really saw it clearly that communicating correctly is additive. Get it wrong and sales can really be impacted. Mm -hmm. Allison, did you have any comments? Um, <sighs> I would just have to say, I, I, I think that there are examples of that out there. I have not, in my years here, experienced that around any of the institutional sales that we've had. Doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I don't, I can't think of an instance here where we put something up and we felt like, well, that should have done better, but because of the buzz, it did. So different experiences, I guess. Yeah, thank you. And Michael, how about you? I have any experience with this? Well. Yeah, I don't. I don't really have anything particular to add. I think Nina hit hit the nail on the head. Good, good. Um, one thing. Um, one other question is, you know, the Met a few weeks ago um, announced that they would be looking at potentially deaccessioning to help out with some of their financial issues. Do you feel like that's going to just create this tsunami of of other museums following suit? I. I I hope I'm right when I say no, but I think not. Um, uh, my feeling about it is that, you know, most museums are coming up on a year in the pandemic in their fiscal year. They know where they've been. They kind of know what things look like or how to project. Yes, it's gone on longer, the pandemic has, than anyone anticipated. But I, I rather think that to the point Michael made at the beginning, you know, museums generally are pretty slow moving. Um, so I rather feel like in most instances, they already know what they're going to do. And I don't know that that's, you know, one institution, granted it's the Met, um, is going to change anything. And I also, I mean, look, recently I've had a lot of conversations, um, surprising conversations, I think, with development directors who are saying, we have a lot of support out there. I had one say to me, money is rolling in at the moment because we've got patrons that have not been able to spend their money anywhere this past year and they wanna be helpful. Um, and there have been a number of foundations as we all know that have rallied other foundations and the troops to come up with creative ways to stem the tide of you know, financial loss at all kinds of arts organizations. And I think that, that you know, government has stepped up a little bit here and there. Um, it's not as bad as AAM predicted, I think. Um, and I don't, as I say, I hope I'm, I'm right in saying that I don't think that the floodgates are going to open and we're going to be overwhelmed with museum property. Yeah, I, I, I concur with uh, Allison's assessment. Uh, you know, the, the Met is uh, in many, many ways America's greatest museum. It's part of a very small group of encyclopedic museums in our country. Fewer than 10 exist. The great majority of museums, you know, 99% plus uh, exist in a different sphere, even if they're very, even if they're well endowed. Uh, and um, so yes, the Met 
having a more flexible attitude does help the broader, what do I call it? The in ecosystem, the environment, mm -hmm. intellectual environment for the discussion and framing it more broadly. Uh, but the, the specifics of the, uh, everybody else is such a different reality um, that- Good point. That, that I don't, you know, it's like, really? Am I in the same solar system as those guys? <laughs> Nina, Nina, any thoughts? What, what do you think, Nina? Um, I think that so many institutions look to the Met to set a course. I, I, I agree with both of you that it's not going to open the floodgates on future deaccessions. That, that's not what I'm saying. I do think that the way that the Met has taken, you know, Max Holland's essay that, that went live on, on the Met site, really, he, he took the time to explain exactly what they were doing. And I think that that helped other institutions feel confident, feel clearer. The Met was very clear in saying, we're looking to deaccession works that we would look to deaccession at any time. So let's be super clear about that. We, we might use the proceeds in different ways because of financial need from the last 12 months. And I think he was just so crisp and thorough in the way that he laid these points out. And I do think that many museums are paying attention to that. And it's very helpful for the, for the field because of the clarity of his communication. Do I think it's gonna open the floodgates for other museum sales? No, I think what it helps museums do is make their own decisions more clearly because the Met is setting their course. I, I have been very struck by how many other institutions have cited the, how the Met is communicating to, to me just saying like, wow, this is clear, this is helping us. So I, I do think people are paying attention. It's a good model. Yeah, that's great. So we have another uh, question from the audience about uh, selling a piece. How much lead time is needed to place a work in auction from start to finish? Like what's generally, I know there's probably a lot of variation, but um, how long does it take? Generally, we say three to six months, but it can be shorter than that. It really depends on um, the timing of the sales. So uh, most sale categories, um, we have over 80 different sale categories, and all of those sales have a, have a trajectory over the course of a year. Um, the big sales that everybody reads about in the press, the contemporary sales, the impressionist sales, um, those sales take place in May and November, the really big ones that you read mm -hmm. about. But there are other ones in those categories, perhaps, especially contemporary, between those two dates. And some of them are online, some of them are live. Um, any given sale category will have um, its, its a moment at a particular time of the year, and usually twice a year at a minimum. Um, so uh, in order to... to meet the deadline and execute a number of marketing initiatives that we might recommend for a particular work of art. I would say at a minimum, we would like to have three months, but I mean, I've been known as I'm sure my colleagues have too, to get a call on a Monday and do a pickup on a Friday and it's in an auction, you know, the deadline's the next week. So it can be shorter than that. But um, I think optimally, we would say at a minimum of three months, um, simply to be able to execute all of the marketing initiatives that we would want to do to have the best sale possible. That's great to know. Um, thank you. And because we have only 10 minutes left, um, I want to shift a little bit toward the future. Um, we do have, let's see, hold on one second. Um, one more question about mechanics. Are there any um, areas of collections that would sell poorly in the current market that you might advise museums to wait on uh, till the market might um, pick up? Nina? Well, you know, as, as, I, as I said before, our job is to keep our museum partners informed on where there's market demand and where there isn't. And we, we, we might just as readily say, okay, let's, let's perhaps steer you away from selling 19th century furniture right now. And, and if you're looking at other parts of the collection or at least say, look, there's not a huge demand for one collecting area over another. And that's, that's really part of the, the very kind of unvarnished stewardship 
um, and kind of knowledge sharing that, that we need to do. And I just want to echo what, what Allison has said all along is, is we're very, um, and we, we, we do this purposefully, where we're very aligned so that the success of our partners is our success and giving them honest, straightforward advice, you know, it's, it's additive for everybody. Also, I think everybody needs to understand that, you know, there is a, there's a, the art market, but there are many silos in that market. And to Nina's point, you know, 19th century brown furniture may not be particularly appealing to a lot of collectors today, the way that contemporary art is. Um, but, but what the same people are not buying contemporary art and a chin long vase and a book. Um, those are all different markets and they all have their own trajectory and certain, I mean, I think when museum is selling sort of across many different categories, you know, some things will do particularly well, some things won't do so well. At the end of the day, I think we try to keep everybody focused on the big picture. Um, what's the ultimate result at the end of the day and obviously delivering an experience where to Nina's point, they're educated about what to expect and what not to expect um, is, is really the best outcome. So there's no surprises. Well, and uh, I would say from a taking the museum perspective for a second, uh, if they if you have offsite storage filled with brown furniture and you're paying the monthly storage fees and temperature for temperature and humidity control uh, and you realize that the market for that furniture is relatively soft the museum people would have to make a calculated uh, guess of, uh, you know, is it worth it to pay that for the next 10 or 20 or how, however long it might be? And it could be forever. So, uh, uh, That's a good point, Michael. I think it, even if the market might be soft, there's no predicting whether it will ever uh, come back in a vigorous way. It's possible. And, uh, go ahead. No, it's possible, but I, I would say not likely, but. Mm -hmm. It's true. And, and those then, are know, exactly the considerations that, you know, it's, it's why um, a museum is different than a private individual because the museum leadership has to make that kind of calculation. And while we're talking about 19th century furniture, it's exactly right. Where does it become more costly on many different fronts to actually hold on to this material. And, and even if it's not what the market is desperate for, it's making that calculation with your partner at the auction house of how to do this intelligently and strategically. So I, I actually think that's a, that, that's a topic, Michael, that, that yes, every museum director who's considering um, refining the collection is, is, is probably asking themselves. Mm -hmm. Yep, they're looking at all of those tapestries rolled up and storage <laughs> Caring for objects has a price tag. You're absolutely right. <laughs> so let's shift. Um, we've got six minutes left to the future. What kinds of things can you um, all suggest museums think about um, as we come upon come up, you know, upon a year of the pandemic and future sustainability? Um, what are your thoughts or suggestions on how museums move forward and their relationship with auction houses? I would, um, you know, I think we've all made the point that, you know, the message around your sale is essential. And, you know, one of the benefits of selling at auction is, is, is the public nature of, of that transaction. I think that, you know, a lot of institutions are um, attracted by the fact that you can use your auction as a, a platform to promote your institution and what your future uh, is meant to be going to be as a result of these sales. Um, so uh, it's, it's actually, uh, there's some good that can come out of having a sale uh, in that, you know, our market is global. And if you want to talk about what the museum is going to be doing in the future or what um, uh, categories of collecting the museum is going to focus on or you know, what programs this is gonna enable the museum to do, those are all part of um, what can be promoted through an auction. You know, we include essays about that sort of thing in the catalogs if museums are interested in that sort of thing. So I think that there's, 
um, there are opportunities to, to sort of look ahead uh, and make what you're doing um, uh, understood really to, to buyers. And I think that, that uh, to the point, I think probably all of us have made is museum property tends to be very desirable. And I think when a buyer understands that what they're purchasing is having this specific effect on an institution, you can see more bidding. Nina, uh, any thoughts? I mean, I, I actually think what, what Allison says is, is spot on. The, the auction sale is an opportunity not only to talk about the objects, but to talk about the institution itself. And, you know, in the last year, how we all communicate with our own buyers, clients, constituents has just changed, right? It's, it's, at Sotheby's, the, the, the physical paper catalog is going to be a dinosaur very soon. And in fact, we have fewer and fewer of them. And we've been learning how to communicate with our own clients differently. Well, guess what? This virtual communication has, you know, we've become quite sophisticated at it. And I think we're very ready to use that um, to the benefit of our museum partners, because this is a moment where museums are changing and the sales that we put forward publicly, as Allison says, it, it, it's a moment for us to help the museums talk about themselves and help on a global, um, on a global platform, you know, it, other um, other possible supporters and, and museum appreciators to, to really understand each institution better. Yeah, and I would, just, I would just say that I think for museums, this um, you know, tragic uh, phase that we've been in the last year, uh, you, you know, really, I believe has motivated everyone to begin to, to, to think more intensely about what they want the future of their institution to be. And what, what would it take to get from point A to point B? Maybe they don't need XYZ collection because they wanna be the greatest fill in the blank in this area. I'm just remembering, uh, I've forgotten who sold the, the ancient things for Albright Knox, who were only, you know, going to focus intensely on contemporary. Those kind of strategic directions, which can precipitate the accessions, which can then fund that future vision, are, are really uh, exciting prospects. And I think the auction house should be considered a. a uh, at least from the director's perspective, uh, uh, a, uh, a teammate in helping to realize those dreams. Well said. What well, else is there you. to say? <laughs> yeah, I know. We're done. We've tackled it all. Um, thank you all so much for being with us today um, and imparting all that wonderful knowledge for museum professionals. I'm sure it was really appreciated. I know I got a lot from the session. So thank you so much. Welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Really, thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Julia. And thank you to all of our participants. And uh, we'll have a brief break now. And we look forward to seeing you all back at 1.30 PM for Chris Bedford's keynote address. You can always check our bulletin board on the website for any updates and uh, know that we will be sharing the recordings from this event with all registered participants. Keep an eye out in the coming weeks for an email with the links and also an evaluation which will help us to plan future events. See you soon.